President of the United States, frail, confused, bitterly partisan, desecrating the memory of recently murdered children with tired talking points from the Democratic Party, dividing the country in a moment of deep pain rather than uniting, his voice rising amplified only as he repeats the talking points he repeated for over 35 years in the United States Senate, partisan politics being the only thing that animates him, unfit for leadership of this country. So what can we learn from this? Well, the first most obvious answer is that the system in place didn't work. Gendron's teacher sent him to a mental hospital for evaluation. They knew he was a threat. They tried their best. He committed a massacre anyway. So we know for a fact that what we're doing isn't working. But we should also be honest enough to acknowledge that it's very hard to know what to do instead. Despite what you may have heard, the problem isn't that we don't care enough. There's not a person in this country who was not horrified by the sight of murdered children. It's the worst thing, and everybody thinks that. The problem is that the human mind is much more complex and harder to control than we like to admit. A person who is intent on committing violence is very hard to stop under any circumstances. An act of Congress isn't going to do it. Neither will gun control. There are more guns in this country than there are people. There always have been. However you feel about that fact, you can acknowledge that we will never get rid of all of those guns. The Constitution prohibits that, and you would set off a civil war if you tried to do it. So gun control, whether you find the slogans appealing or not, will not stop the next patron Gendron or Salvador Ramos, and every rational person knows it. happening. And this is bigger than a single mass shooting or even two of them in 10 days. There has been a huge increase in violence in America, on our streets, on public transportation, in our schools. It's not a guess, it's measurable. From January 1st to April 10th of this year, robberies in the New York transit system are up more than 70% year over year. Felony assaults in the subway have increased by 28%. Grand larceny, according to the NYPD, is up by more than 100%. Those are all crimes of violence. And that's just underground. The same thing is happening on the streets. And if you don't know it, you just got back to the country after a while. According to ABC News, quote, about 11% of violent crime in the city of Los Angeles involved a homeless person in 2018, 13% in 2019, and 15% in 2020. If that was a graph, it would look like that. Keep in mind, the homeless make up about 1% of the total population of Los Angeles, but they're involved in nearly a fifth of all violent crimes in the city. Oh, but ignore it. It's not happening. And yet everyone who lives here knows that it is happening because the numbers go up every year. And if you have kids, you know it's happening because it's the same story in the schools. The executive director of the National Association of School Resource Officers, Mo Kennedy, told Fox Business that schools are, quote, seeing more aggression in terms of fights. Sometimes they're shoving matches, and sometimes they're flat-out assaults. It's more misbehavior, thefts, and those kinds of things. In schools. It didn't used to happen. It's happening now. Why? It's not guns. It's not the gun lobby. More American families had guns at home 50 years ago than they do now. According to the Rand Corporation, which studied this, 45% of American homes had a gun in 1980. In 2016, that had dropped to 32%. So the problem is not that we're more armed than we were. The problem is that people have changed. Young men have changed. They're more violent. Why? That's the bipartisan conversation we need to have now. And that conversation has been drowned out by lunatic attention seekers who are hoping to win the next election. But we don't need them now. Never mind your election. There's something really wrong. And we can figure it out if we try. There are probably a lot of causes. The use of antidepressants in this country is increasing dramatically. Between 1991 and 2018, total SSRI consumption increased in the U.S. by more than 3,000 percent. 3,000 percent. Remember, these are supposed to reduce mental illness. Now, that's a real stat. It was published by the medical journal Science of the Total Environment. And it's not just this country. In Canada, state-funded antidepressant prescriptions for young people doubled over the last decade. Then, during the lockdowns, SSRI prescriptions increased even more. A pharmacy group called Express Scripts reported that antidepressant prescriptions went up by more than 20% during COVID. According to the latest figures, more than 40 million Americans are now taking psychoactive drugs. That's roughly one in 10. So again, the point of these drugs is to make you healthier mentally, to reduce suicide and violence. And yet suicide rates and rates of violence are spiking. We don't know that that's causation, but it's worth looking at.
Oh, so the lockdowns dramatically increase the incidence of mental illness among young people. And in 10 days, we've seen two mass shootings by mentally ill young people. Could there be a connection? Now, that's not finger pointing. It's not to blame Fauci for yesterday's shooting. We're not that low. We're not Joe Biden. But if people are becoming mentally ill because they're disconnected from others, what can we do to connect them to others and thereby reduce the incidence of mental illness? That's a real conversation. Is there a more important one? We have a lot of mentally ill people and we need to stop ignoring them. Obviously, we've ignored that warning. So here it is again. What effect? Well, is anyone studying what murderers, not just mass murderers, but all murderers have in common? Apparently not. It would be nice to know. Instead, they're telling us about the gun lobby. Please, no one believes that. And why, by the way, is the answer to mass shootings always universal gun confiscation? Shouldn't we be focused on the people who did it, on the dangerous people? Uh, I mean, it, I, I think that the uh, obsession that people who are doing politics full time have with seeing the war, the world through this prism of partisan warfare is so consuming that it basically drains their entire soul so that nothing yes. is left but this kind of immediate need to get, use every situation, no matter how tragic, to gain some kind of an advantage. And look, you know, Joe Biden is a politician. He's in public policy. There are public policy aspects to events like this or the one yes. in Buffalo. So if you want to talk about that, that's fine. Wait a little bit of time, not just so that the emotions can be processed, but so that just basic facts are known about who this person is, what motivated them, what guns, what role guns had in terms of gun control yes. laws or anything else you want to talk about. They don't wait at all because they want to exploit those emotions that they could be using to unite people to instead work them to their own advantage. It's so ghoulish and grotesque to watch.